So again, it's good to have you here this morning. Thank you for being with us. And uh, again, those of you online, we're glad that you could be with us as well. So I just love seeing all your faces. So I'm glad you could be here. It's nice and warm in here too. We need that. So here we go. We're continuing in the book of Acts. If you were with us last week, we looked at this quote. It was kind of interesting. Uh, author Michael Kelly said, the entire Christian life might be built on the understanding of one word. And he picked an unusual one. He picked therefore. Therefore. It's in scripture a lot. 442 times. Bob Sheets actually looked it up after the service and texted me. He goes, you're right. So I appreciate <laughs> making sure I'm saying true things up here. But uh, that's what he chose. Therefore, why is therefore such an important word? When we see it in scripture, why should we pay attention to it? Because often, not always, but often it links two things. And here's your English lesson again for today. You're welcome, Kim. She's so excited. Uh, therefore, links an indicative. It's just a fact. This is a fact, whatever that fact is. And it links that with what's called an imperative. What is that? It's something you should do or believe based on the fact. So the fact isn't just out there in space. We connect to the fact with our life and what we do and what we believe. So I gave you some quick examples like the stove is hot, right? That, that's a fact. If you had the burners on, the stove is hot. Therefore, don't touch it, <laughs> right? One from scripture, the days are evil. Well, that's a fact. The days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. That's what we should do based on the fact. And last week in Acts chapter 13, I suggested that the therefore in Acts 13 might just be the most important therefore in all of scripture. Why? Because of the fact that comes before it. And because what it calls us to do and believe based on that fact. This is what it was. Paul in Pisidian Antioch is preaching and his main message is this. The fact is this. God sent Jesus. He's the Messiah who died and rose again. That's the main message of Paul's sermon in the synagogues there in Pisidian Antioch. Therefore, he says in verse 38, therefore, what should we do about that? Why should we care about that? How does that fact connect with our lives? Paul said, therefore, believe in Jesus. Believe in him. Put your faith in him. Why? So that you can be forgiven and so that you can be justified. Forgiven. He remembers your sins no more. He doesn't hold them over your head. He doesn't use them against you. He doesn't see you through the filter of your sin. You're forgiven. And then justify that legal term which says you are not guilty. You are not guilty. The judge has declared you innocent. So my question for all of us last week was then, have you been forgiven? Have you been justified through your belief in Jesus Christ? That's the whole point of the therefore. God sent his son, Jesus. He's the Messiah. He died and he rose again. Well, that's a nice bit of history. That's a nice fact. So what? Therefore, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be forgiven and you will have the freedom of being declared not guilty in the eyes of God. Isn't that a, an amazing message that Paul had? It's for the people 2,000 years ago and it's for us today. So that's where we were last week. So to get us started this week, I have a question for you. We're going to vote on it a little bit later. All right. You can only vote once. This isn't Florida. So here's the question. Does the gospel unite or divide? Does the gospel unite or divide? Remember, the gospel is simply the good news of Christ. That God sent the Lord Jesus, that he lived a sinless life, that he died on the cross for our sins. That he rose again three days later so that whoever believes in Christ will have eternal life. It's the good news for all people. That's what the gospel is. So this good news that we proclaim and that we believe and that we read about, does it unite people or does it divide people? Jesus talks a lot about this. 
Paul talks a lot about this. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. So think about this as we go through our morning and then we'll vote. See what you think. Does the gospel unite or divide? That's what we want to think about this morning. So let's pray together. So Heavenly Father, thank you for this chance to look at your word. Would you speak to us through the Holy Spirit and through the word of God? We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this time. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. We are continuing Paul's first missionary journey. I know uh, it's kind of hard to read some of that, so I made it bigger. There we go. That might help a little bit. Paul's first missionary journey took about two years, 1,200 miles, right? A dozen churches or so were planted. Last week, uh, Paul and Barnabas and John Mark at the beginning were right up here in Perga. Perga. This is what we know about what happened in Perga. John Mark left and went back to Jerusalem. That's all we know. That's all it says. Most of chapter 13 happens right up here in a city called Pisidian Antioch. Right up here, this is where the therefore was part of Paul's message. It was in the synagogue in Pisidian Antioch, not the Antioch that they left from. That's way down here. They're up here now. And what's interesting is up here, they spent about a week or so, the first Sabbath, Right? They're preaching in the synagogue. Some people put their faith in Christ. It seemed to go rather well. The next week, it says almost the whole town gathered. They probably weren't in the synagogue. They won't fit. They were probably outside in the marketplace. And that's when things began to get ugly. That's when the Jewish leaders began to resist and rebel. And they actually threw Paul and Barnabas out. It says they expelled them. That's a nice way of putting it. They threw them out. <laughs> so Paul and Barnabas are on the move because they were kicked out of Antioch. There for a week, and they are now kicked out. So where do they go next? Next, you can see they go down here to the city called Iconium. That's where they go next, the city of Iconium. We're going to take you there before we look at it in God's word. So thanks to our friends that tried through history. Here is your, it's quick this time, your two minute tour of Iconium. All right, so here we go. Our next stop is the ancient city of Iconium, located about 90 miles southeast of Pisidian Antioch. Iconium was located right in the middle of Asia Minor on the Roman highway known as the Via Sebaste, so many travelers and traders would have passed through the city. Iconium was also situated on a wide plain at about 3,300 feet, known for its grain fields, orchards, and sheep. Ancient Iconium is known as the modern city of Konya. The ancient city has been largely lost under the modern buildings. But during the Roman period, Iconium had a theater and a great temple to Zeus, indicated by inscriptions and coins featuring the image of Zeus, discovered near here. Other statues, reliefs, altars, and inscriptions of various other deities and emperors have also been found in the area, many of which have made their way to this museum in modern-day Konya. According to Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas arrived here in Iconium and went to the synagogue to preach. As a result, a number of Jews and Greeks became followers of Jesus. But similar to Pisidian Antioch, an angry group plotted harm against Paul and Barnabas, so they fled to the surrounding countryside, where they continued to preach the gospel. Despite strong opposition, Paul's courageous preaching was effective, and Christianity began to flourish here in ancient Iconium and in the surrounding area, as is indicated by a major church council that occurred here at around 235 AD. Another indication are these ancient inscriptions and carvings that you can see today at the museum here in modern-day Konya. Here is an anchor, a symbol for early Christianity, and beneath it, you can clearly see Jonah and a great fish depicted. The great fish in whose belly Jonah stayed for three days, a covert way that the early church would refer to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right, 
Well, the video gave us a real quick overview of Iconium, but let's look and see what happened with Paul and Barnabas. So I invite you to take your Bibles, please. And if you would, turn to the book of Acts, chapter 14. It's only the first seven verses, one through seven. And again, as we read in the back of your mind, think, does the gospel unite or divide? What did it do in Iconium? What does the gospel do? Does it unite or divide? And then we'll vote and we'll see what we think. All right, here we go. This is Acts chapter 14, starting at verse one. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others sided with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and the Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconium cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the good news. So, does the gospel unite or divide? Which one does the gospel do? All right. How many say the gospel unites? Don't be shy. Any folks uniting? How many say the gospel divides? How many say the gospel does both? How many say we're tired of raising our hands? Okay. No. <laughs> oh, I think you're on to me this morning. I think you're on to me. Because does the gospel unite or divide? It certainly united the apostles, right? It certainly united the early church members who faced persecution. It surely unites us today. So does the gospel unite? Yes, it does. Does the gospel divide? Absolutely it does. It, it divided people back then. It divides people today. So the truth is this. The gospel unites those who believe it. But it divides them from those who don't. I'll say that one more time. The gospel unites those who believe it. But it divides them from those who don't. Let's take a look at the first part. It unites those who believe it. You know, we are united more than just by we're from central Pennsylvania and we live in the same general area. We, we are united ultimately by the gospel of Christ. That's what truly brings us together. It unites us in a way that things other things cannot do. And back, oh boy, weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks ago, when we were way back in Acts chapter 4, <laughs> that might have been months ago, uh, we looked at this fact that the gospel unites. Because in Acts chapter 4, verse 32, it says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. They were one. They were united in heart and mind. Now, how in the world can this be? Even back in Acts chapter 4, according to Scripture, when we look at the number of men that it says, and we factor in women and children and families, you're talking well over 10,000 people. It's a lot more than that now in Acts 14. But back then in Acts chapter 4, how do you get 10,000 people to be united in their heart and mind? Scripture says that these were people of different ages, from different backgrounds, from different cultures. They are from 15 different countries. From 15 different countries. How do you get these people to be united? Well, it goes beyond what, might, what they might have in common. Because what we looked at in the sermon back in Acts chapter 4 was their unity was established by the gospel. That's what it says in verses 32 and 33. 33 talks about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and how they put their faith in that. What does that sound like? Sounds like the gospel to me. So they were united by the gospel. 
they experience that unity by being generous with each other. And then, of course, that unity was endangered by hypocrisy in Ananias and Sapphira not being honest about their giving to the Lord. But the main idea was the gospel really did unite them. It, it really did. Different classes, different ethnicities, it brought them together. It did back 2,000 years ago, and it's true today. One of my favorite authors, Tony Merida, said this. He said, our strongest source of unity isn't our common affinities. Affinities are just the things we like. You like chocolate ice cream? I like chocolate ice cream. Wow, you know. <laughs> you like the cowboys? Everybody likes the cowboys. Okay, anyway, it's not our affinities. What brings us together is our gospel identity. We are brothers and sisters because of the gospel. We are connected because of the gospel. We're united because of the gospel. And the further we drift away from this ultimate unifier, the further we get away from the countercultural, world impacting, Christ exalting unity that Luke highlights. So, does the gospel unite or divide? It absolutely unites those who believe it. You've probably had this before. Maybe you've gone to another church to visit or another Bible study, or maybe you've been on a missions trip with other people, or as you travel, you just meet some folks who love the Lord, and there's this instant connection that you have with them. You feel close to them. There's a unity there that goes beyond all the other differences. You know, I've traveled all around the world with Operation Christmas Child. I've been in Namibia, Africa. I've been in the Philippines. And there's this amazing unity that I've experienced with other people. We speak different languages. We have different cultures. They asked me to preach through an interpreter. That was awkward. But there was this unity there. And ultimately... It's because of the gospel. So that's good news. For those of us who believe the gospel, we're united, not just by the things we do, but we're united by the gospel itself. So that is the first half of the equation, or the first side of the coin. However, we see in our scripture the entire town was not united. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of division there. So the gospel also divides it divides people who believe in Christ from those who don't. Not, not that it puts up walls that we have nothing to do with each other, but when it comes to our beliefs, what we put our faith in, what our ultimate loyalty is to, they look very, very different. Here are some really interesting words of Jesus, and I'd like to, to turn, if you would please, to Luke chapter 12. Jesus talks for a few moments about this divisive nature of the gospel this divisive nature about the message of him and why he came. So these are some fascinating words of Jesus. These are not the words that uh, are part of the VBS lessons. You know, you're not going to read these words in the hymnals. Uh, you know, I never saw stained glass windows of these words. That would be interesting, though. So uh, Gospel of Luke chapter 12, uh, verse 51. This is Jesus talking. And listen to what Jesus says in Luke 12, starting at verse 51. Jesus says, do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. And daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? <laughs> that's not in the hymnal. Let's stand and sing hymn number five. Let's divide mother-in-laws from sister-in-laws. You know, What is he talking about? I thought he's the Prince of Peace. I thought he came to declare peace. To usher in his kingdom of peace. Why then is he saying, no, I've come to divide. In the Gospel of Matthew, he actually says, I come with a sword to bring division. Well, what in the world is that all about? Well, we certainly see that in Iconium because the people were divided. They were divided because of what they put their faith into. Jesus didn't come to rip apart families. 
but the very nature of the gospel message, the fact that this is true and it is radical and it is life changing and it is something that requires your total belief, just that fact alone, some will receive it, some will reject it. No matter what you do, some people at a particular moment will refuse to believe. You could even do miracle after miracle and they will refuse to believe just like they did in Iconium because it's their choice. And can you see how if some in a family put their faith in Christ and others in family do not, they're still called to love each other. They're still called to serve each other. But can you see that their ultimate loyalty and belief systems are so different? That's why scripture makes it so clear that in the covenant of marriage, it should be between fellow believers. Be equally yoked. You can be different in a lot of other ways. That's perfectly fine. But you are to be connected together with your belief in the gospel because that unifies you. You don't want to go into a marriage relationship divided about the very thing you put your faith into. Why would you do that? So it does divide. And in Acts chapter 14, verse 4, it says the people of the city of Iconium, they were divided. Some said or sided with the Jews, the Jewish leaders that were stirring up trouble, and others sided with the apostles. What did these Jewish leaders do? It's one thing to be divided. It's one thing to say, I don't believe that. I'm offended. I don't believe that. They went way beyond that. It says in scripture, they began poisoning the mind of the believers, speaking deception and lies into the thinking of those who believe to twist their thinking. Oh, come on, you can be divided, but now they're actively poisoning the mind of the believers. Not only that, I mean, that would be bad enough, but not only that, in their anger, in their disappointment, whatever you want to call it, they're actually plotting to kill Paul and Barnabas to stone them to death. That's a Jewish way of execution. So not only are they divided, they're poisoning the mind of the believers. They're plotting against Paul and Barnabas. You thought things in Pisidian Antioch were bad? Welcome to Iconium. In Pisidian Antioch, the people wanted Paul and Barnabas gone. They kicked them out. In Iconium, some people wanted Paul and Barnabas dead. Do you see the difference? The gospel divides. The gospel divides. This theologian who's now with the Lord, R.C. Sproul, says this. Nothing divides like the truth. Nothing divides like Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the truth and the life. Nothing divides like truth. Why? Because you either accept it or you reject it. That's the nature of truth, of objective truth. You don't say, well, your truth and my truth are, are different. No, tr tr truth is truth. So either you accept it or you reject it. That's why there's division. That's why they were so upset. So does the gospel unite or divide? Yes. And it's important that we understand that because there will be times when we share the good news of Christ and people will reject it. At least at that moment, we shouldn't be surprised by that. That shouldn't stop us. I'm convinced Paul and Barnabas were not shocked that some did not believe their message. That's been the pattern of the whole trip. It'll continue to be the pattern as the trip goes on. They go, they preach in the synagogue. Some believe, some don't. Those who don't begin to get upset and angry and want to kill them or throw them out or do something. And then they move on to the next place. They do it all over again. So my friends, don't be shocked or surprised that at times the gospel will be rejected and there'll be this division of faith. Doesn't mean we don't love them. Doesn't mean we don't care for them. But our faith is divided. Don't be surprised by that. That's normal. Doesn't mean you did something wrong. That's normal. It's to be expected. 
So take some, I guess, comfort in that. Because again, success in sharing your faith is to share about Christ and leave the results up to God. That's what they did. And that's what we're called to do as well. The gospel unites those who believe it, right? But it divides them from those who don't. Why? Because truth works that way. Because the truth about Christ works that way. Again, Tony Meredith said this, if the gospel message shared is not both unifying and dividing, both at the same time, in fact, you can be sure that the true gospel isn't being preached. <laughs> the gospel has always united those who believe it and has divided them from those who have rejected it. It's always worked that way. And my friends, if there's ever a message that we say is the gospel that has universal acceptance, something is wrong. That is not the true gospel. We've watered it down. We've made it something that it's not. And may I be bold enough, and I can always erase the video later. No. Uh, <laughs> can I be bold enough to just be honest and say that there are some churches that water down the gospel? Doesn't matter what size, doesn't matter where they're from, there are some churches that water down the gospel message. Why? Because they don't want to offend anyone. They don't want there to be any sorts of division in their thinking and in their, in their family. You know, in the name of inclusion and tolerance and acceptance, the line between truth and opinion gets blurry. That's sign language for blurry. <laughs> The line between good and evil gets blurry. When my main focus is tolerance and acceptance and, and things like that, my biblical teaching about marriage will get blurry. Biblical teaching about family gets blurry. Biblical teaching about human sexuality gets blurry. When you water down the gospel, when you water down the truth and God's word, because we're so scared to offend anyone. My friends, a watered-down gospel is not a gospel. The watered-down gospel is not the gospel. I saw a sign the other day at a church near here. Now, granted, they, they might mean different things with the sign, okay? So the sign said this, tolerance is a part of grace. Tolerance is a part of grace. It's still there. I drove by it yesterday. Well, yes and no. It depends what you mean by that. Tolerating people, absolutely. <laughs> We're called to tolerate and get along with and love and serve people regardless of who they are, regardless of what they believe. That's what grace does. So if they're talking about tolerating people made in the image of God, then amen, absolutely, make the sign bigger. <laughs> but if they're talking about tolerating sin, taking the gospel message and the teaching of Christ and scripture and watering it down so that it's not offensive and then calling that kind of tolerance part of the grace of God, no. Then your pastor will steal a sign. No. <laughs> That's probably not the appropriate reaction, right? For, for example, grace never tolerates sin. Grace never makes excuses for sin. Grace never accepts sin. When, when Jesus talked with the woman caught in adultery, right? And she was probably set up and it was this whole trap. And, but when, when he spoke with her, what did Jesus say? Well, did he show love? Absolutely. Of course he did. He was the only one who did. Did he show grace and forgiveness? Yes, of course he did. He loved the person. He tolerated the person. But then what did he say then? He also said, now go and continue in your alternate lifestyle. <laughs> what Bible are you reading? No, he said, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. He loved the person. He died. He died on the cross for her. But he's not going to minimize her sin. He's not going to tolerate her sin because sin destroys. Sin was destroying her life. No wonder 
Jesus said, you are forgiven. I don't condemn you. No one does. Look, they're all gone. Now go and sin no more. When the gospel is watered down, Jesus may or may not be the Son of God. When the gospel is watered down, he may or may not have lived a sinless life. When the gospel is watered down, he may or may not have risen from the dead. I've heard plenty of churches that preach otherwise. When the gospel is watered down, he may or may not be the only way to heaven. What kind of gospel is that? What kind of gospel is that? A watered-down gospel is no gospel at all. A watered-down gospel is no gospel at all. How did we get on this little rabbit trail? <laughs> because the gospel divides. If, if I preach nothing but God is okay with whatever you do and live your best life now and be true to yourself, and ugh. <laughs> I guess it sounds good. But is that the truth of the gospel? No. So because I'm so worried about offending people, I'm so worried about division, I've set truth aside. Oh, my friends, we're never called to do that. Paul and Barnabas never set truth aside. I'm sure they knew that as they went from town to town and the message got in front of them, I'm sure they knew that the resistance was going to grow. And you'll see that next week. Last week, they wanted them gone. This week, they wanted them dead. Next week, they take action on it. And they almost were. So, does the gospel unite or divide? It does both. Don't be surprised by that. Give thanks that it unites those of us who believe. And also, realize the truth that it divides us from those who don't. We love them. We care for them. We serve them. We want to be like Christ to them. But for those of us who received Christ, those of us who rejected Christ, we are in completely different places in our loyalty and in our understanding. So, how do we respond to those who don't yet believe in Christ? How do we respond to those who are even poisoning the thinking of others, maybe about us? How do we respond? Well, simply do, <laughs> simply, well, it's simple to understand. It might not be simple to do. But look at the example of Paul and Barnabas. Right? Acts 14, verse 3, talks about others poisoning the minds against them. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there. Really? <laughs> they know that the, the lies about them are circling around, and they decided to spend time there. Speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace. Oh, my friends, the first thing they did was they, they spent time there. That kind of surprised me when I read that, right? People are poisoning the minds of the believers. Uh, so Paul and Barnabas stayed even longer. They stayed even longer. Someone who doesn't believe the gospel, what, what do you do? You spend time with them. How are they going to see Christ in you if they never see you? How are they going to hear your testimony if they never hear you? Paul and Barnabas spent time with them, considerable time. I wish I knew how much I read like a dozen books and it didn't say. <laughs> Apparently more time than a Priscillian Antioch. Secondly, they, they spoke boldly. Doesn't mean they were jerks. <laughs> it just meant they spoke the truth. They spoke boldly. When the minds were being poisoned, they didn't change their message. They still shared the good news that anyone can be saved through faith in Christ, that the Lord Jesus is the Messiah. So we speak boldly. I have friends who don't yet know the Lord. I, I like to spend time with them. I'm going to speak truthfully. I'm not going to water stuff down. And then finally, they showed grace. They showed grace. Favor beyond what they deserve. <laughs> kindness beyond what they deserve. You show grace. That's what they did. They spent time there. They spoke boldly there. And they showed grace there. And then the other hard truth is sometimes the resistance is so strong 
You just have to move on. And that's what they did. They learned about the plot of their assassination and they left. They didn't give up. We'll see later, they went back. They, they didn't give up. But at that moment, they moved on. Why? Because other people needed to hear about the gospel. Why? So that it would unite them together, even though it also brings division. So that is the message of the morning. The gospel unites those who believe it. Be thankful about that. That's our identity. But it divides them from those who don't. Don't be surprised by that. Don't be shocked by that. That is a sign that the message that you're proclaiming is the true gospel. Some will receive it, some will reject it. Some will refuse to, as they did in Iconium. But the good news is, think of those who never heard about Christ in Iconium, and now they do. And now the church is growing. It's in a region called Galatia. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> the book of Galatians was written to these people, along with others, where Paul encourages them in the faith. My friend, the gospel is the most amazing fact of truth in all of history. It'll unite some, it'll divide some. But let's be sure that we stay true to it. And like Paul and Barnabas, we continue to not get discouraged, but we continue to share the good news and leave the results up to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this reminder of the gospel. Thank you that it unites us. And I pray, Lord, that as we share this news with others, if at that moment, if what we receive in return is rejection or refusal to believe or even opposition, Lord, would you help us to not be discouraged, to not be surprised, to not give up, but just to realize that that is the nature of what the gospel does. And would you help us to continue to share this life-changing news with other people. We love you, Lord, and thank you for this time. And it's in Jesus' name I pray.